Welcome to The Pestle, reviewing and breaking down movies to look for insights into the movie-making process. Hosted by Telekinesis, the laziest superpower of them all. Now, let's dim the lights with the remote control and start the show. Welcome, everybody, to The Pestle. Today's show is brought to you by Seduce and Destroy. Respect the cock and master the bush in Frank T.J. Mackey's best-selling book, Seduce and Destroy. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, Jeez. to The Pestle. I am Wes. And I am Todd. And this is a film podcast uh, for film lovers. Um, and even better, if you like are creative, um, I know... I struggle with a little thing. So I've been talking uh, to someone recently and they were talking about how they have, you know, a hard problem calling themselves an artist, even though they have like an actual degree in art. Um, and I identify with that. Like I'm a filmmaker and for years I struggled uh, with imposter syndrome of calling myself a, you know, a filmmaker, a director, or really anything that felt like I belonged. Like I almost tried to exclude myself in a lot of ways and it never really I mean I'm just in one week from today I will have been a full-time filmmaker for nine years um, and I still walking in and for me I still get nervous uh, before shoots even on shoots where the stakes are pretty low uh, I shot a boot uh, information video like kind of a DIY video last week and this is as low stress as it's going to get in our field um like the client provided the talent provided the voiceover uh and the location um and the and all the supplies like i literally just got to show up and you know create uh and i was still stressing out going in i was like is this going to be crap am i going <laughs> to uh you know embarrass myself and the client they're going to have to fire me and um am i doing it right you know and all these thoughts just kind of flood through my head on every shoot. And I don't know if it's something that I can really stop. Uh, it's just the way I operate. And for me, I, I try to use that fear um, as a way to propel myself forward into making something good um, and shot it, turned it around and clients very happy and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it just, for me, it never really goes away. Like I'm always, um, you know, on whatever tenor hooks and just anticipating how can I do this better? How can I be, you know, confident that the client is getting what they want while also me feeling like I'm getting what I want. I feel like it's so important for me to walk on a set and want to create something that I love and something that I'm, I'm happy with. Um, yeah, it, for me, it just kind of always is right there bubbling under the surface, under the surface. Um, and so I'm curious, like for you, do you still, I, I don't, I don't know how your process works, whether you're making music or you're producing. Um, how does that look for you? Do you deal with imposter syndrome or you just squash it and say, I'm just here to do a thing. I'm going to do my thing. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, every, literally every second of every day. I mean, I <laughs> have to remind myself that, that, well, I, I don't really consider, I don't know. I guess I don't call myself an artist either. So I guess that's a good point. Um, obviously, you know, an established musician like, like Beyonce, I would call her an artist. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a, it, that might be like a, in music, at least it might be like a newer thing to call musicians artists. I don't know. I just, I don't remember growing up ever hearing that term in related to music right or a musician like an artist maybe mm. maybe but it feels like a newer thing the last like 15 20 years anyway yeah i've never really called myself an artist to say musician and i can call myself a musician for sure um uh but uh but artist yeah it feels i don't know that's a good point because it feels like an artist you have to be I don't know, like there's prerequisites for to call yourself that for some reason. I don't know, but I, I do struggle with imposter syndrome every single day. I mean, and I've had, a, you know, a little, I wouldn't say success, but I mean, I've had like wins in my career, mm -hmm. I would say. Yep. Um, career. I'm even putting that in air quotes. Uh, I've had, you know, 
good things that have happened even, you know, this past year. So to still um, have that, I think, is normal. You know, I, I think that even established artists that, you know, have like a big record, they might have imposter syndrome and, and think, think, oh, you know, what if that was a one time thing? And, and, you know, and I think it's really easy if you have like a bolt of lightning idea, right. And you finish it and it comes to fruition and it's just as good, just as good as you pictured it would be in your head. Right. Just say, um, I, I am the kind of, um, person where I will go back and analyze and think, oh, that wouldn't have happened if this and that and that and that, and I dilute my own artistry or my own creativity in creating that. I, I think, you know, that's part of being your own worst critic. And I'm sure this person that you're talking about, who I probably think I know who you're talking about, but I'm sure that this person probably feels the same way in, in that but but I don't think that, you know, I try to remind myself that that kind of stuff, that's life, right? Life is inspiration and you got to kind of take it where it comes. And it's, the difference is the people who actually do it. So um, one of my, my best friends in the world, uh, uh, my mentor in music, um, he told me he brought his son to this, this uh, it's a quick story, brought his son to this museum in like Europe or something when he was little and on the wall was a, a painting of, I think it was like, Oh, it was a bunch of paintings of just black. Right. And there were shapes and stuff in the black. So different shades of black, but it was all the whole, all the canvases were just black. Right. And, um, but they were slightly different, obviously. And he, he said, his son said, said, dad, what is, what is this? I could have done this. I can do this, you know, and I'm eight or where, however old he was. And my friend said, yeah, but you didn't. And that's the difference, right? The difference is, it's like, you know, I could be inspired by something that's, and you call it inspired. I could be, I could, something could happen to me or happen around me that could make me want to make something. And because I make that thing, diluting it in my head mean means that, oh, you know, I wouldn't have been this creative had this thing not happened. Well, it's not just about creativity in real world. In real life, it's about creating when you're not even feeling like creating, right? Like there's sometimes I come in here and I have nothing and I don't want to be in here, you know? And for the most part, if I don't want to be in here, I just am not. I just make that decision. But sometimes... I push through it when I feel like I need to and something comes of it. And I think that that's the difference. It's like, you, you can't just, you know, you're an artist because you create, not because, um, you know, um, uh, of any other, of any other thing. And so I, I get the whole feeling of, of, of feeling like, uh, you know, you're an imposter. There are other people that are more creative, other people that are more productive, but I guarantee you all of those people that you think are more creative and more productive feel the same way about other people. And those people feel the same way about other people. And it's a snowball thing. So, um, yes, I, I feel that way. That's awesome. I feel that way right now. <laughs> and, and we started this by me saying, Hey, I got this cool track that I'm working on. It's, I'm like really excited about it. Um, and it's just this little idea, but I still feel like, you know, oh, you know, if, if I hadn't found this sound or this loop, then that would never have happened. Well, yeah, but that, you know, a thousand other people could use that loop, but not turn it into what I turned it into. So, yeah, I, I feel that way too, man. Well said. Nice. Okay, so what are we going to cover today, man? So, yes, today we are reviewing Magnolia. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. So if you haven't watched that movie, pause this episode. It is streaming, I believe, on HBO Max. Um, so you can go catch it there because there's going to be spoilers all over the place for this movie in particular. Absolutely. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about a bunch of things. It's a three-hour uh, marathon here. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot going on. But we'll touch on some of the cin cinematography, long takes, the transitions, the, the way they framed using anamorphic lenses. Um, we'll touch on ensemble writing, uh, the music. I have a few Magnolia flower facts and other such stuff and things and stuff. 
So a synopsis of the film, an epic mosaic of interrelated characters in search of love, forgiveness, and meaning in the San Fernando Valley, written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, cinematography by Robert Ellswit, starring Tom Cruise as Frank T.J. Mackey, Melora Walters as Claudia Gator, Philip Baker Hall as Jimmy Gator, Melinda Dillon as Rose Gator, Jeremy Blackman as Stanley Spector, William H. Macy as Wizkid Donnie Smith, Philip Seymour Hoffman as Phil Parma, Jason Roberts as Earl Partridge, uh, Julianne, Julianne Moore as Linda Partridge, and John C. Riley as Officer Jim Curring. Sidney Barringer jumps from the ninth floor rooftop. His parents argue three stories below. Her accidental shotgun blast hits Sidney in the stomach as he passes the arguing sixth floor window. He is killed instantly, but continues to fall, only to find, five stories below, a safety net installed three days prior for a set of window washers that would have broken his fall and saved his life, if not for the hole in his stomach. So Faye Barringer was charged with the murder of her son, and Sidney Barringer noted as an accomplice in his own death. And it is in the humble opinion of this narrator that this is not just something that happened. This cannot be one of those things. This, please, cannot be that. And for what I would like to say, I can't. This was not just a matter of chance. <laughs> These strange things happen all the time. So, I assume this was your first time watching this one. Um, no. Have you seen Magnolia before? Yeah, a couple times. Um, PTA just has such a weird, deep library that I assume most people don't watch it, <laughs> like most of it. So, that's pretty cool. Um, I'm curious then, what did you remember from it before watching it versus... What did you realize, like, oh, uh, while watching it this time? Um, well, I, I mean, I remember the acting. It's just uh, phenomenal uh, across the board. I remember the frogs um, at the end. Uh, I remember um, TJ Mackey. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't remember, you know, like, uh, a lot of the storyline and how they all intertwined and didn't remember that it was three hours long. That's for sure. <laughs> I started it and I was like, oh my God, wow. But it it goes by. Yeah. It goes by really fast. I think because there's so many stories that you bounce back and forth between that it's it doesn't feel that long. And um, it, it feels like right when you might get tired of something, it feels a l like they switch. You know, and they go, oh yeah, we're back to, to uh, the cop now. Okay, cool, cool, awesome. Um, and there's something to love about um, like all the characters, all of them. And uh, so every time you go to a new story, you're, you're kind of happy that you're with this this character again. Uh, I th I think things that I forgot were. Um, uh, What's his name? Uh, let me see. Uh, is it um, uh, where? Where is it? Sorry, Philip Baker plays the uh, game show host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what he did to Rose. Uh, I I forgot about that. Yeah. You know, I forgot about how the frogs like what. I forgot about how the frogs affect everybody at the end right um there were things that i caught uh that i didn't catch before there are there was a, a genesis quote that comes on in the the street on the signs i think when, when it's like super quiet there's nobody on the street there's one moment where the genesis 12 6 or something exodus think, yeah exodus thank you yeah this bible verse comes on there and i looked it up during the movie and was like, oh, okay, it's referring to the, the frog plague. I was like, okay, okay, cool, cool. And I think that a couple other, there were a couple other Easter eggs in there that you'll probably bring up or talk about that I don't, I don't know. But that I noticed, um, and I looked it up because I was like, is this referencing frogs? And it did, so cool. Um, but I think I was just more re, I, th okay, this is a movie that makes 
me fall in love with movies um and the power of what film can do because it does so much um without doing a whole lot like it's weird and quirky in some ways it's very loving and slow and um, methodical in others. It, it's hits you over the face in, in others. It's like takes its time. It develops exactly on pace that it should. It, you know, normally we sit here and we're like, man, that movie is two and a half hours. Oh my gosh. It could have been an hour and shorter and, and been just fine. I could have watched another two hours of this movie. Yeah. And I think it is a lot to do with one, the directing two, the cinematography, um, and this, the, the, uh, and, and, and the acting and, and the writing, I mean, like everything, just everything is so awesome. I think the cinematography is something specifically for me that I noticed and loved because it was, they did a lot of shots that were obviously bumpy mm. and not stable on purpose. Like I, the one that I'm just coming, traffic thinking about light. right now, the what? The traffic light. Was it like? Yeah, at the traffic light when they go across the the in, intersection mm-hmm. uh, to what's her name to um, Rose. Uh, Claudia. No, Rose? that's yeah, Rose the wife. Oh, that's what I mean. Okay, yeah. so what Jimmy did to Claudia, that's mm-hmm. what I didn't remember. So yeah, when they go across the street to Rose and it's all shaky and I'm just like, what is happening? Um, you know, I think so many movies would have would have not done that, and it, that would have been fine. Mm-hmm. Would have been fine if it was stable. Yeah. I, you know, would have been fine. But I wouldn't remember it. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, and other shots like where it would be going down the street and it would turn around and Donnie Donnie's in the car right there and he's like, "What am I doing?" And he turns around. Stuff like that. It it was just brilliant. And and I think that that, I mean, it might have been a cinematographer call there, but I I feel like that's directing. Like sometimes you can just feel that felt like a director call mm-hmm. right there. If not in the moment, at least in the editing room, right? Maybe they did one stable just in case, but he chose that. Um, but if nothing else out of, out of all of that, that I'm saying the acting is, is just an absolute clinic from everyone. Um, everyone cast all, from Tom Cruise, all the way to John C. Riley, who murders that role he is flawless and you look at that guy like it's it's so great because you look you've got tom cruise who's just like this you know over the top masculine beautiful man right who's amazing actor like we've said it on this podcast before tom cruise is absolutely phenomenal as an actor i don't care what you think about him personally the guy just brings it and he and he brings it 100 percent all the time um you know learning to fly a jet for top gun like you know flying a helicopter for mission impossible like all of these like he brings it 100 percent, which is why he's perfect for for the tj mackey role so because he's just bringing it 150 percent. that's just what he is but not just him but from him all the way down to like it, so putting John C. Riley next to him, who's like just this random guy, he seems like a random guy that would li- be your neighbor, you know, next door. Like, oh yeah, John next door, right? He doesn't seem like a, an A top grade A list actor, right? But he is phenomenal. He's just perfect for that role. So whoever cast this film. Um, just just killed it uh, in that regard too. I mean, everyone just is wonderful, wonderful. But I don't think that all of those performances would have been what they were had it not been for for PTA in this. I feel like he had a lot to choose from, and he picked the right takes on on everything. Um, uh, the best scene for me, or the best acting scene for me. Um, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to pick, uh, but I want to try just because that's the thing that stands out to me is the acting, um, is man, it's, it's really hard to pick. I think if I have to only pick one, it will be, uh, Tom Cruise when he, when he gets to his dad's bedside. Um, and basically he goes from this calm, 
or, you know, like seemingly calm character and then just at, completely loses it. But it's over kind of a long period of time. And that kind of thing is really hard to do as an actor. It's really easy to explode, right? Just to get instantly mad um, and for it to be believable. But to slowly grow that anger and slowly let it out methodically over i mean i know they cut away right and they went to a couple of different scenes you know and then would come back to him but i i'll bet that take was a wonder and i'll bet it was um was you know i don't know a good three minutes long of him slowly getting angry that is so so hard to do um and it was so one like wonderful to watch uh this guy who obviously didn't care about anything anything or anyone other than himself completely lose it and then you know kudos to uh <laughs> kudos to Paul PTA uh for the writing to then beg him not to leave you know and after just saying like like f you I hope you die. Don't leave. You know, um, it was just really, really beautiful. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Let you chime in and then we can put on some of your notes, but no. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt kind of the same way. Like I've only seen this once before and the only thing I could remember were the frogs. Um, one frog deflecting a, a, a bullet, you know, hitting the gun. Um, and I forgot that. Yeah. yeah, and Tom Cruise as some kind of uh, sex god guru. And that was literally it. Like, I kept trying to remember what what this movie was really about. And the frogs just have such an impact that I couldn't think past those guys. Um, and I couldn't remember, was I happy or was I frustrated with the frogs? Um, until, and then I, you know, sit down and start watching this thing. And then all these stories start coming to life. And they all feel familiar but they also feel brand new. Um, and it was really just amazing. I, I, whenever I think of the movies I have PTAs that I love, it usually starts with punch drunk love. Um, and I mean, boogie nights is fine. I know everybody loves boogie nights. Um, and there will be blood is fine to me. Like, uh, the performances in there, but I usually kind of start and stop with punch drunk love. Um, because you know it's such an odd film. Adam Sandler is doing something incredible in there, um, and now after having watched Magnolia, I'm like, I think this is probably I. I don't want to suffer from like recency bias, but <laughs> I it I was like, this is an incredible movie, and you were right, man. Like, if it had been an extra two hours, I would have sat right there and you know chewed through that too, um, yeah. because there is so much going on, and uh, it couldn't have been shorter. I. I was thinking about that, watching it for, uh, I watched it twice before this episode. Um, one time just to sit and enjoy and then another time to take notes. And uh, towards the end of that second time through, I was like, is there anything I would want to edit or remove? Because you would have to cut a storyline in order to really make this thing shrink. You'd have to kill someone's storyline. And they're all just too interwoven. Um, because you could look at someone like uh, Stanley, Spectre, the kid, who uh who was you know on the jimmy gator show um killing everybody on that show like stanley just knew everything and i was like you you can't really remove him because he's a reflection of donnie um and he's also kind of hinting at something bigger with jimmy uh, especially once you get to the end um and you realize jimmy probably was a child molester um and you think about him running a show with kids on it and you're like how, how many kids did he hurt you know that was on the show um, was that like an avenue for him to to hurt people um and these are fleeting thoughts that they don't even address on on in the film it's just stuff that you can walk away with as you're thinking about it um and i really couldn't you know and and, and if you kept him and you wanted to maybe you know cut uh quiz quiz kid donnie smith like you can't really cut him either because he's kind of a foretelling of uh, Stanley's future, um, and even Stanley's name, you know, Specter is uh, kind of a, a reflection of that, like a specter, a ghost, um, and he's kind of a haunting of both Jimmy and and Donnie, 
Um, and those two characters are intertwined, even though they've never met um, and never meet through the film. Like everyone is just playing a, a very specific part um, and overlapping in interesting ways. Yeah, this and God, just to piggyback on what you said, John C. Riley is incredible. Like he never lets up his and it's so interesting just to kind of contrast him with Tom Cruise, because, yeah, Tom Cruise is this, uh, and he's he's bringing it, he's over the top, his character's over the top, um, and he's just bringing it, and he's, yeah, beautiful, and you contrast that with John C. Riley, who's got these larger-than-life features, he's got this curly hair, and these strong facial features, and, um, and yet he's understated, uh, but because of all his uh, characteristics, he can be understated and still, like, have a punch on you, um, like, he can make you laugh without trying to make you laugh, and um, he can make you uh, sigh, you know, with just his uh, gentility whenever he's talking to Claudia. And you can see him, on on the one hand, trying to be serious, but also not trying to be stern in a way that's going to put her off. Uh, like, he's telling her, hey, just one last thing, you know, I don't, I don't like to talk shop over coffee, so I just want to get, you know, Officer Jim out of the way, and then it can just be uh, us, you know, having a conversation. You got to turn down your music. You know, you're going to you're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> you're going to damage your hearing. You. <laughs> you're going to damage your hearing. And, you know, the, there's people around you. You know, you got to think about them too. And he's trying to, like, give her the what for without actually um, dressing her down. Like, it's it's uh-huh. a really interesting dynamic, and – even whenever he's talking to the kid, he's like, okay, we'll continue. But you know, without the lip, <laughs> you know, he's just, yeah. he's just this really fascinating character because it's all coming from a place of, even whenever he's doing like pure comedy, it's always come up coming from a place of just pure sincerity. You never feel him trying to be anything. He's always just completely in the moment playing the person opposite him, you know, what's in the script. And he's just 100% authentic. Um, the scene where him and Claudia are sitting and having dinner. Um, and he's trying to uh, tell her that, you know, whoever you are, it's okay. It's fine. Like, I'm, I'm okay with who you are. Um, and you can see him really, even though they're rarely in the same frame, you can see him really just trying to connect and let her know. Like, it's okay. It's okay, you know. Um, and you can feel him fighting for her. Uh, and that's... Man, that's beautiful. It's hard to do as an actor, especially if they're not there with you in the same frame. Like she's obviously there across the table from him and she's given him a lot to work with, but he is just completely uh, fighting for her through the frame, through the lack of her in the frame. Um, and it's it's astounding. Um, but everyone here, like Julianne Moore is timeless. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. And you completely buy into uh, her you know, transformation or just the, uh, the guilt as it kind of rolls over her. I mean, everyone, William H. Macy never ceases to astound me. Like cutting from him as a kid to him as an adult is one of the greatest transformation, like makeup jobs ever. So good. (laughs) Because you believe it. You're like, yeah, that is the quiz kid, Donnie Smith. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I was just completely uh, caught up in this film and I'll roll through some notes here and I, I know we'll, we'll hit on uh, several moments, especially at the end. Um, but with the, the cinematography, just so many long takes, uh, both, you know, oneers like these long, strung out camera moves, uh, but also just a lot of long takes with just static shots. We're just going to sit there and, and let this person have the scene, um, even though they might be talking to someone, uh, they they really just let us hang out and focus on one person at a time, uh, which is really interesting. You don't see a lot of this editing done in most films. It's usually cut around dialogue. Like this person's talking, we're going to kind of watch, watch them. And they might like J cut or L cut, uh, which just means like you might hear dialogue from someone start before you actually cut to the frame of them talking. Um, And here they really just let someone have their moments. Like if you think of Tom Cruise sitting down to do the interview, uh, we start that section with this really long, slow push in as he's wigging out. Like he's having this really manic moment um, as he's just still, you know, vibing off of uh, talking and presenting to all, uh, all the boys in the crowd that are losing their minds over, you know, sex and trying to trap women into sex or whatever. 
Um, and so we start this really long, slow push in, even though the, the interviewer's there, she, she's talking, she's trying to get his attention um, before we eventually cut to uh, her. And it's not, but it's not until we like really get from a wide to like a medium close on, on Frank uh, before we cut to the alternative uh, point of view to see her as she's, and we, I love that we can still see him in the corner of the frame as he's just being weird. Like he's talking about being a dog and he's like wagging his tongue out and you can kind of see, catch all this stuff on the edge of the frame. And, uh, but you're identifying with her because you're watching her deal with this. You can feel like, what would I do? Like, how do you like corral this wild man? Um, and it's just beautiful editing, uh, which I think really comes from the writing. And it's another thing like you were talking about. That's a director moment. Like the director has a, a thing that he's trying to get at. Um, and so these long takes, these long static shots um, really let us focus on someone and stay connected regardless of who's talking. Like at the end, when Jimmy Gator is confessing to Rose, um, all his infidelities, like we hang out on Jimmy, even whenever she's talking, like he, they really just let us focus on what this person's going through. And as an actor, you have to stay in it the entire way through. Um, you, you can, and as, and as a director, you have to know whenever you have the take and you have to be able to give corrections uh, because this means that you can't cut around performance. Like I've, I've had to do this, you know, a lot, even if it's me in the film, like I'm cutting around my own performance uh, as you're trying to find the best take for this line or the best take for that line or the best moment. Um, and in, in here, they have to give you one perfect, beautiful take. And so as a director, you might have to step in and say, hey, when she's talking, just sit there. Just listen. Don't react. You're just going to sit there and listen to what they have to say um, before you, and let that bottle up so that whenever you give your next line, there's something in there. There's gonna You're going to have something extra to deliver because you're not reacting yet. You react whenever it's time for you to react. Um, and so they do. He just does a really great job. And with this many characters and stories, uh, it's probably best to reduce edits, which is going to help you ground the audience. I mean, for a three hour runtime, it also probably helps reduce viewer fatigue, you know, potentially um, by reducing the number of cuts. But the tricky thing is uh, there's also so much movement that it still could be a challenging film in the beginning, especially because there's a lot of zo uh, zooming and dollying in. Um, there's just tons and tons of movement. And maybe I feel like all the movement in the front half of the movie is to help the movie feel like it's still setting setting in, it's still settling, um, which is maybe kind of an illusion, um, an illusion to help maybe the first half kind of speed by uh, so that whenever it does kind of settle, it just feels like you're getting into the movie even though you've been here for an hour and a half. Like it's been just constantly pushing and dialing and you're walking around through spaces and um, camera move from this person to this person um, seamlessly. And so I think all that movement is kind of helping it feel maybe like you're still getting into the story so that uh, you don't feel like three hours has gone by by the time the credits roll. Um, kind of a slate of hand maybe from the director's seat. There's a really fun little slow-mo switch that they do. Uh, you don't see this a ton in movies. Um, it's the scene where Donnie kind of uh, talks himself up in the car and then he walks into the bar and he sits down and then the waitress comes over to take his order and it's this section where the waitress walks over and gets his order, right? And we kind of do this uh, Dutch angle where the camera tilts to... From there, it seamlessly moves into slow motion um, without cutting. And I just find that kind of stuff interesting because that means that whole section was filmed in uh, 48 frames per second. And you got to be very conscious of when you're doing that. Uh, with the lighting in, in the scene, like there's some practicals on the wall and there's like this little video game console sitting next to the, the booth. And if you're, if, if you're not really paying attention, you can get more flickering than you probably want uh, before you're ready for it. Um, and the scene can come across choppier because 48 frames crammed in, into 24 frames uh, can produce a very uh, choppy effect. And that's great for like action sequences and sports scenes, um, but maybe not as great for a drama whenever you're trying to uh, 
uh, emphasize the loneliness and uh, the disconnectedness of a character. And so you have to be very conscious of how you're shooting this, how the characters are moving, and how quickly uh, the camera movement is uh, before you cut to the slow-mo or before you want to initiate that slow-mo switch. Because after that, now you can move as fast as you want. Um, and that kind of emphasizes the, the slow motion aspects. Um, so that's just a really s simple, like, I don't know, 60 second shot, 90 second shot uh, that I, I just really enjoyed because uh, you don't really see that kind of stuff too often. Um, the transitions, my God, throughout this entire movie, uh, the way he's, he's switching scenes, if I wanted to do an ensemble film, I would definitely, this would be one of a handful of films I studied a lot. Um, between something like Traffic, Crash, uh, Magnolia, um, I this I think kills those others. You know, in terms of transitions, um, the close up of Donnie whenever he's meeting with uh, Solomon Solomon, uh, who's played by Alfred Molina, um, just this little brief cameo, um, but he he's wanting his keys back, and Donnie like slams the keys on the table, and we cut to a close up of these marital rings being you know laid on another table and that's the scene where the officer jim had found the dead body in the closet um and now they're kind of tallying all the items that was in this uh person's possession it's her wedding rings and what have you um and they're both kind of playing into kind of the similar idea of something has ended like uh we're, we're now moving on um donnie no longer has his job he's giving up his his keys and um, this woman had, you know, killed her spouse and now that's over too. Uh, so that's subtle, but it's, it's connecting these two scenes through a close up of these metal objects that, you know, have some kind of representation of what those characters are dealing with. Um, and throughout the entire movie, I mean, they're just constantly, especially that opening sequence, that's just dollying in, pushing in, pushing in, pushing in. It's breathless. Like I, after a while, your eye starts to get a little tired, but it's just so interesting. You also can't stop watching. <laughs> like uh, that's hard to do, um, and it's clever because on at the same time, if you really were to go in and break down all those sequences, they're showing you how all these characters interconnect um, right there in the beginning, and that takes a lot of patience and writing and uh, thought with your cinematographer, your DP, to say how can we make this absolutely sing? Um, because you start to have to think about okay, well, what is this location that we're shooting in and how can we uh, start inserting these ideas through this location and how should we film this sequence? Um, so you, your location scouting starts to matter a lot and, uh, from that you know, point of view uh, and a thousand other things. The lighting, some of these scenes are really, really long and they're like walking through hallways and I can imagine they probably had to swap out all those lights, all those fluorescents are having to get swapped out uh, in order to match the color tone that you want um, and to make sure they're not flickering. So, hey, can we get Kinos in those uh, in those fluorescent uh, sockets? Like, just tons. It's just endless. Um, but PTA is super patient uh, with and that I, kind of stuff. I, 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 a lot of times in writing, you know, writers, writers will say, you know, start from the end and write your way into it, right? Yeah. That's kind of hard to do with this film. Yeah. Like, what's the end? Okay, frogs are raining from the sky. Uh, how do you get there? Well, you just do, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of, that's that's at least for this movie. Yeah, it's crazy. I love the, uh, the use of anamorphic here. Um, it probably, on the one hand, helped shoot a lot of those long wonders uh, because now you have a little bit more uh, room to play in terms of uh, your, your latitude left to right. Um, and so if you don't quite nail the, the camera move, you still have a little room to play. On the other hand, shooting anamorphic makes pulling focus a nightmare. Um, there's just a lot less room for, for error when it comes to pulling focus. And they did an incredible job. I think they also probably sh tried to shoot as wide open as they can, can but uh, it also means, again, the lighting takes on a, a much bigger uh job task like that's, that's it's a lot to do but using the the anamorphics i thought was fun because shooting anamorphic means that the the screen is going to be a lot wider than most films um, due to the way the lens kind of compresses the image on the sides um, and then once you're done filming you kind of stretch it back out uh, and that's why you get these these longer wider shots um, but it also changes the way you're going to frame people uh, and i love it for this 
particular use because a movie about loneliness, uh, the framing helps strand people by themselves so much more. Whenever you have this much more room to your left and to your right, if you put someone in the center, they look that much more by themselves. Um, even at times when they're framed with other people within the frame. So if you think of someone like the scene when Officer Jim goes into Claudia's apartment, like they frame when they when he walks in, they frame her on like the far left and like he's on the far right, and it helps create this gulf, this chasm between the two of them. Um, because even though they're both lonely and now in the same frame, they're still so painfully far away from each other. Um, and that's just a really excellent use of anamorphics um, and a way to think about your framing and composition and why do you choose the, the lens that you're going to choose. Uh, it's playing a very significant role in the, the emotion of the story uh, that's all about loneliness. Um, and from a cinematography standpoint too, I love the use of the eye lights. Uh, specifically with Claudia, like I, I'm pretty sure everyone has a really strong eye light, and that's just that little glint that's coming off of people's uh, eyeballs. Like this, this little highlighted shiny ob object uh, reflectance, uh, specular um, on people's eyes. But with Claudia, they gave her, uh, especially at the the dinner scene with her and Jim, um, they gave her a double catch light, and so there's two. One is right beneath the other. There's one that's kind of sitting right in the middle of her eye, and there's one, another one that's, you know, just below it towards, like, not quite at the bottom of her eye, but just below uh, in the middle. And it gives her a very sad look in her eye, like she's tearing up. And it's perfect because it really adds to her stress and her vulnerability. And uh, what's her name? M Melora Walters is, just does an incredible job of feeling stressed out and coked out like she can't sit still um, even when she's sitting still she can't really stay still um, so you can feel her anxiety the entire time and what she's wrestling with um, that you don't really know until the very end uh, the last sequence but it's just perfect use of using another eye light to to give her another sense of she's on the verge of tears and she could break at any given moment um, it's absolutely gorgeous um as far as writing the writing for an ensemble i mean every single character is distinct and fully realized uh frank for instance so manic this dude is just wild he can't contain himself um and even his entourage act like he does as you would expect you know from this kind of cultish figure uh like whenever uh the the phone calls coming through right um, what's his name? Phil Parma, uh, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, the, the oh, hospice gosh, nurse. Yeah. God. He's calling and he's trying to get to, through to Frank and he finally gets through to, to this woman, Janet, who works, you know, uh, beneath Frank and she has to call and get one of his lackeys on the phone. And this guy is just giving her shit and he walks over to Frank and he's like, effing Janet has some effing problem. Like he's just kind of down on Janet. Janet's just over here doing her job. She's just like, doing her job. The way yeah. they treat women like is very emblematic of, you know, Frank himself and uh, the lifestyle that he leads and the way he thinks about the world. Um, and it's just, it's perfect. Every one of these characters um, have a fully realized aspect to them that's realized by the people around them. You know, Stanley, right, has got this crappy dad who's just, railing on him all the time um and yet you know tries to give these very crappy uh i love you like at the end of it he just uh he's being a jerk right why do you need four bags you don't need four bags love you <laughs> like, he's just the worst and it's perfect like you think of yeah you know child actors child stars and um the pressure that comes from parents um it sits perfectly uh jimmy gator right his his world is run by uh, TV and the way uh, the the, the stagehand is, is dealing with Stanley. Um, he's needing to go to the bathroom. She's like, you can't do that. <laughs> like causes him mm -hmm. to wet himself. It was just absolutely crushing. You know, it's interesting you talked about the dad because there were a couple of moments I noticed about the dad where, because, I mean, being a parent, I know there's plenty of times where you just, where, you know, you get mad and sometimes it's, it's, warranted to a certain point and then other times you know 
it's you're just a jerk um and it happens but so yeah the point where his dad realized that he he wet himself that was a point where the dad could have could have said oh my gosh like okay let's go let's go to the bathroom whatever or like get gotten mad at the stage uh hand for for telling him he couldn't go um he didn't that prove because he was a jerk before that but now we know oh no he is a he is a really bad dad okay now we know who this guy is that that was a really good way to establish because it could have been effective without the dad going down to to talk to him to mm-hmm. stanley could have been effective um with just the 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 lady saying you can't go right now and that would have been enough but they want to solidify no this guy's a shithead okay have him realize that Stanley wet himself and say, get your stuff together. Okay. So we know he's a jerk. Um, but then, so at the very end where Stanley goes into the bedroom and says, you, you need to be nicer to me. And he says, go to sleep. And it's very dismissive the first time. And then he says, you need to be nicer to me. And the way that his dad responds, like, I want to put it on that actor. Like it was really it was perfect because it was very you know he's he told him to go back to bed but he did it in a way where we know as viewers he 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 is um he's realizing right that he's been a crappy dad and that he needs to change in that moment but he does he's still he's afraid to admit it Right. Yeah. All by saying the same line that he said two seconds earlier to the same person. Just the way that he said it was was perfect. It was just, it was perfect. And that, you know, it's so funny. We talk about actors all the time, man. But it all comes down to the director. Huh. It really does, because he could have done that twenty other ways, um, and it probably would have been good, but. PTA just knew what he needed to get and he got it from him. And it was, yeah, that felt like a direction moment too. Obviously the actor needs to deliver, yeah. but yeah. Anyway, that was just a really, really good moment with the dad. And you made a really great point though. Like, because up until that scene where he wet himself and the dad goes over, like I remember watching it and you know, he's launching this kid's bags out of the car and I'm like, you're such a dick. But then he's, he throws in like, Hey, I love you. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Maybe he's okay. Maybe he's not so bad. Um, and it is crucial. It is crucial to have that moment where he has the opportunity to be the hero um, and to completely walk away from that moment. Um, and yeah, that's that's a really great point um, because that solidifies, okay, you know, this guy is just the worst. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the it, for, for writing in an ensemble, it, it seems important too, usually, um, that characters overlap or relate to others uh, throughout the film. Like there's a ton of those little moments where um, the ambulance speeds by, you know, carrying um, Linda Partridge, who's OD'd or whatever she's taking the drugs that, that she wasn't supposed to mix. Um, and now she's being carted away. And we, we pass the camera movement, passes from following the ambulance to uh, dollying over. And now we're with uh, Donnie Smith. Um, and he's having his realization, like, what are you doing? Um, and so it, having these overlapping moments or, uh, characters relating to each other, um, is, is super important. I mentioned earlier, like the connection between Donnie Smith and Stanley. Um, but also there's these really great moments, um, like Claudia and towards the end is finding love, right? There's that hilarious and adorable scene between her and Jim where they kiss and he's, mm-hmm. she's like, do you want to kiss me? You, uh, I, yes, I do. <laughs> and then we just quick zoom yes, into their kiss. It's, <laughs> Camera goes right into it's it. So, yeah, it's just a really fast dolly in. It's so hilarious and adorable. Um, and we cut from that to her father is losing his love by admitting guilt to not just the infidelities, but he's indicating that he molested Claudia. Um, and then we cut from that to... Claudia getting up from the table and trying to walk away from love um, herself and, you know, just the abuse catching up and um, she'd never really settled in her heart, you know, her self-worth because she's 
surprised that you know Jim could want to go out on a date with her and could could possibly like her and um, it's all to her surprise and it goes to the self-esteem that she lost through the way her father abused her um, and I love uh, we get to the scene where her mom comes in and is holding her we cut to that painting that's on the uh, hanging on her wall um, and in the very small right hand corner of it it says it but it really did happen um, it's just confirming that, yeah, she was hurt. Um, and also love that at the very end, it's it's the last scene. It's when Jim makes his way back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Break the fourth wall. Yeah. She, yeah, that's right. She looks at the camera and it's like, yeah, you know what? Fight. Yeah, it's so there are a lot of different. Um, well, I guess we. Do we want to talk about the frogs? Um, or are you going to get to that? One more second. You know what? I'll because uh, I don't really have a big thing about the frogs. Um, there, it, it's fun. Um, but there's one other thing, uh, writing wise, that I found interesting, which is they he he references movies. Normally, if you're in, if you're watching a movie as a screenwriter, you'd never say the word movie because watching a movie and then hearing the characters talk about a movie, uh, it breaks the suspension of disbelief. That's not something you really want to have happen. Uh, Similar, if you're watching a TV show, they never talk about TV shows. Like normally it's the inverse. If you're watching a movie, they talk about, well, in TV shows, um, and in TV shows, they say, well, in the movies, like those things never want to talk about themselves um, for that very simple reason of you don't want to break the suspension of disbelief. But this movie makes a point to break your suspension of disbelief in order to generate buy-in, uh, which is a weird, wonky, crazy idea um, that I would not advise anyone to ever do uh, because it's just, it's a gamble. Um, but in this case, the reason he's doing that is because some of the things that happen in this are so outlandish that he wants to make sure you believe that this can happen, that this is a real thing, um, to give you buy-in to the idea that, you know, frogs could very well fall from the sky. Um, and that's the whole reason for that five, six minute intro, um, where we're seeing all these coincidences happen, right? Um, who is it? Stanberry Hill or whatever, the guy that gets murdered by three characters that oh, have yeah. the names uh, Joseph Green, Stanley Berry, and Daniel Hill. Um, <laughs> it's He's trying to build these ideas. The scuba diver was in a tree. It's crazy, um, it's, but it's not a coincidence. And that's the whole point of that opening you know, segment. Um, this is not something that just happens. This narrator does not want to believe um, that these are coincidences. These strange things happen all of the time. Um, and he's trying to get you to believe in a world where coincidences happen, but that maybe they mean more than what uh, a coincidence would leave you, lead you to believe. Um, and so, yeah, fog, frogs fell from the sky. What did you take from that? What was your lesson? Or how did you see the this interaction with the characters themselves? What was the significance to you um, of the frogs? Uh, okay, so... So to me, there is an obvious, um, and a lot of movies I try to dismiss a religious tone mm-hmm. just because I just assume that that's not me- meant. But in this case, I feel like it's there. Um, and I feel like um, the choice of it being frogs is very direct, um, a very direct Christian reference, right? And that everything that happens at the end happens the way it's supposed to happen. It just, so this is, it's something that just happens, but this is not something that happens that not just something that happens. So it's hard to explain. So the way so let's take a couple examples. Um, uh, and I am terrible with the names, so forgive me. Well, there's only Here 700 of them in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's start with, let's start with uh, the father. Uh, what's his? Um, Stanley's dad. Stanley Specter. Uh, okay. Uh, he's in a coma because he just had the 
the stuff dropped on it, the morphine, the oh, liquid uh, morphine. Earl Partridge. The, Earl Partridge. The Thank dying you. Man. Gosh, gotcha, I'm so gotcha. yeah, I'm so bad with names. Um, a, so the sound of a frog hitting or frogs hitting the roof wakes him up. To, so he has just gone on this long, huge tirade earlier about how he's just, he's admitted to all this terrible stuff that he's done, and he's 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 asked asked for forgiveness, but he's he knows that he's shit, and you know whatever. So, Frog wakes him up from his coma, essentially, to see his son there, basically forgiving him, right? Right. Mm -hmm. That's one scenario. Uh, um, Jimmy is trying to kill himself. Is it Jimmy? No. Uh, J no, that yeah, that's is... Yeah, Jimmy Gator. You're right. It's Jimmy, Jimmy Gator. He's trying to kill himself, and a, and a frog prevents him from killing himself. He doesn't get the easy way out. Uh... He's got to live. Right. Uh, let's go to whiz kid, Donnie Smith. Um, he's, he's trying to break in to, to bring back all that stuff, right? A frog and he's, he's been vain this whole time, spending money on stuff. He doesn't need like dent oral surgery. <laughs> frog hits him in the face. He falls down, busts his teeth open. So now he doesn't have the money. Or now he he ha now he needs it, but he doesn't have the money because, uh, um, uh, Officer, Jim, yeah. Officer Jim, uh, makes him bring the money back. Um, he's a good guy and has had really shitty luck on, in his life, so he doesn't get arrested. You know, so Jim wants to be this kind of like, he doesn't want to be the guy who exacts the 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 law. He wants to be the guy who, who like helps people, right? And he helps. Whiz kid Donnie Smith. He helps him um, by saving him from the frogs hit, falling on him and helping him take back all this, being there to make him take back all the stuff, do what's right. But now he doesn't have the money to fix his oral, his, his mouth, right? So now he has busts up teeth, doesn't have the money. So he, he is punished, but not in, oh, and not overly punished, right? Um, uh, what else was there? There was, uh, Okay, Julianne Moore. She's in the she's in the um, the ambulance, right? She's being saved, right? And then we don't know what happens. To, I guess she's okay at the end, right? She's in the hospital, mm. but but that whole scene of the the ambulance crashing because of the frogs, like she deserved that, right? She's been pretty terrible that whole time. Um, and oh, and at at the end, uh, uh. uh Claudia and Rose meet together at the end to to hold each other together at the end in the in their in Claudia's apartment. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, while the frogs are are falling, they're holding each other, comforting each other. Like I just feel like everything that was supposed to happen, the way that like a good ending and that a just god would exact it happens because of the frogs. Um, and it could have been anything, right? Could have been anything, yeah. but choosing frogs is so biblical yeah. and calling out the, you know, the Exodus, um, uh, quote, Bible quote, uh, that at that one point in the street on those signs is so on the nose that it's kind of hard to say otherwise. Um, should anybody watching that having known about what that passage is expected frogs to fall from the sky no but so much you know any wh what is it it's it's anything uh it's just something that happens right it's not something that happens that that's not something that really happens but it's something that happens and i think there's a dichotomy there right there's this there's this you know belief that something can't happen unless God intervenes, but there's also this belief that things just happen, right? And you could either look at this and look at all of these stories converging and being their own separate story. And if you're looking at it from, from an inside point of view, like in one story, you're thinking, oh no, none of these things could happen, but this is happening. This just happens. And then if you st take a step out, like we are as the viewer, we look at it and we say, and we say, 
wow, this, this is not something that just happens, but it's something that happens. It's happening right now. And, and that's what the, uh, the young kid yeah, uh, says at the end. Yeah. This is something that happens or some, something yeah. like that. So, yeah, I think it's biblical. I think it's, uh, it's, it's religious. Um, I don't know if he is religious or not. I don't think it matters, but I think it's very rewarding um, obviously it's something that you remember, right? It's a way to take, it's a way to end a three hour movie where you walking out like, what the hell was that? But it's also a way to, to go back and rewatch mm-hmm. and think, oh, okay. You know, I, I get it. Uh, or I understand a little bit more, or I see that, or I see that, that I didn't notice before. And, and leading up to what we know inevitably will just happen, which is the frogs. Long way around, but that's kind of what I think. Nice. Hit that. That's great. No, I think you nailed it. I have absolutely nothing to. Uh, <laughs> I mean, add. yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I I bet that we have some viewers who have like really good insight into all of that, mm-hmm. um, it, much more than than what we have. But uh, it's just it's a beautiful it's a beautiful way to try to explain the unexplainable. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I don't know what I think, to be honest. I don't know if, if things just happen and it's, or if it's the universe or if God intervenes or I don't know any of that stuff. I don't pretend to know. Uh, I mean, you know, could, could frogs rain from the sky? Sure. Is there a bigger meaning behind that? If that happens, maybe not to me at the time. (laughs) Maybe if this really did happen, it didn't mean anything to you and me. It was yeah. just like this weird, weird thing. But to these seven characters or seven different storylines, it absolutely did. Um, it's interesting. It's not like they all converged together. Yeah. It's that this this overarching thing happens to the entirety of of where are they? They're in San, San Fernando. Fernando. Yeah. Valley. Ah, the Valley. Eight one eight Beachwood <laughs> Avenue. Um, this, uh, this whole thing happens to the valley, and but we're watching it affect all of them separately. It's it's that's interesting. It's crazy. It's crazy. So with the music, um, I mean, I love the music. I love the use of the music in this. Uh, on the one hand, it keeps a lot of the momentum and connectivity between the scenes and characters kind of flowing. Um, but it also creates these interesting moments where, like, if you strip out the music. It allows a much stronger moment, like in the interview with Frank, and she starts bringing up his history, and that lack of music, that silence, suddenly has a bunch of added weight, right? As she's like, what are you doing? I am silently judging you. (laughs) I love how tight they are on him. Yeah. I'm quietly judging you. It's just, yes. Bang. Um, and then they also have this really strange and beautiful moment that's one of those moments where I'm like, I wish I wrote that, where all the characters start singing the song together. And they're oh, talking about so how... Amy Mann. Who is it? Amy Mann? Amy Mann. God. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Um, and what, what was the song about? It's like, yeah, you have to, you have to wake up. What's oh, that? it's something... Um, uh, give up or something, something about giving up where you're save me. Yeah. Save me lyrics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of it is, you, you know, I'm going to pull up the lyrics real quick just to make sure I don't butcher this because I wanted to say that it was about needing to, to wake up, wise up. She's saying that you have to wise up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then give up at the end or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting just from the standpoint of going back to, uh, I guess, the, the frogs, because this is about people's people needing to move forward um, and to start rethinking the way they're, they're living their life and the way they're viewing the world. Um, you do need to, you know, wise up, so to speak. Uh, and it's, this very surreal, odd, and beautiful moment um, that really does, I think, speak to, you know, the heart of the film. Um, and we will get 
to the whole Exodus uh, thing here in a few minutes. But with kind of that in mind, like a couple quick facts about Magnolias. (laughs) You know, John Bryan did the the score, by the way. I did not. Yeah. I'm not sure I know who John Bryan is. Oh, uh, he um, he's done. Uh, he's been around for forty years, fifty years. I'm like guy's old hat. He he actually, um, uh, beautiful machine. I think it was that that album by Fiona Apple, um, what? or whatever. He did the first version of that. Look for anybody listening. There is another version of that album. What is it? It's like beautiful machine or something by Fiona Apple. It, not the version she released. She did a, the entire album with John Bryan, and then she redid the whole album with another producer. But the John Bryan version is way better. Anyway, John <laughs> Bryan is amazing. That's wild. Continue. Continue. So, uh, for one thing, Magnolias, little little, little factoids. Um, <laughs> there's, it's they're they're over twenty million years old, and so they kind of symbolize longevity and oh. perseverance. Um, and you know that's kind of interesting because i was just trying to figure out why do they name this movie magnolia um yeah over 20 million years old kind of symbolizes longevity and perseverance um and what and so i feel like you know the the thread that's kind of running through magnolia is you know this connectivity and um your past catching up with you um and along with that uh, this is interesting this is i don't know it really ties to anything um but apparently magnolias appeared before bees did um chronologically in history and so magnolias are theorized to have evolved to encourage pollination by uh beetles i guess um and so it plays a pretty important part of you know our evolutionary history um in theory uh obviously we can't fully know something like that but yeah, so magnolias, important and interesting. Uh, old. <laughs> little factoid. Little, little factoid. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I got. I think this is just a wonderful okay. movie. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. So you watched it, you watched it twice. Yeah. The, the rewatchability is pretty high, even Super it being high. three hours long, right? Yeah, there's all these just little moments that you'll forget. You'll get to the end of the movie and you'll, you know, forget these little close-ups like even at the end uh whenever the 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 hospice nurse uh philip seymour hoffman whose name is phil parma phil parma yeah yeah which is interesting just because it feels like a little bit of an anagram um almost saying that uh, like he he provides pills and you know he's a pharmacolo- pharmacologist or something pharmacologist. Yeah. yeah and so there's like this little light wordplay uh that i think is probably going on there but Phil uh, never says what he's about to do, and whenever Linda leaves the scene, she's kind of, kind of saying her goodbyes and saying, "I'm going to walk away now." Um, and you know, there's tears that are coming into Phil's eyes um, because he knows what he's about to do too. And all we really see happen is him pick up the vial, like he picks up the vial of the morphine, um, and that's kind of that. Uh, but it's a very quick insert; like if you blink, you miss it. Um, to really make sure that you know he's about to set the uh, the, the end game in motion here, um, and yeah, there's other these other little tiny close-ups that happen uh, all throughout the, the the show that I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, the little boy did get the fun uh, the the handgun, um, and yeah, his his thread running throughout the film, yeah, so super rewatchable. There's just all of these little details all the time every every scene is filled with it yeah yeah i i I loved it too it's it's so funny because it goes against a lot of what we say makes not what we say makes a good film but what we like about other films or dislike about films right uh it goes against it but it does it so well uh the acting is beautiful the cinematography is beautiful and it's pointed it's very purposeful um there's reasons for all of it there's reasons why there's a super close up or why there's a zoom or why, you know, there's a pan or why it's static or whatever. There's all these reasons and, uh, or why there's space between them. Like you mentioned between Claudia and Jim in the apartment, it was just brilliant by the way. I, I just was like, it popped in my head. I was like, yeah, that 
beautiful because and the camera is like low yeah. so they're tall yeah. in the frame and they're on opposite end it's just really really well done with that with that photograph or that painting in between them the painting that has the little blurb on it that says this this it really happened yeah that you mentioned earlier is between mm-hmm. them um uh is very metaphoric and and uh yeah so anyway all, all that this stuff is just so it's full of all this stuff it makes me want to go watch it again um yeah. so Paul Thomas Anderson is one, definitely one of my favorite directors uh, in my top five for sure. He always has been. I just love like everything he does um, pretty much. I mean, even if it's a movie where I'm not crazy about it, I can find beautiful things to love about it. There will be blood. I mean, that's very hard to watch multiple times. However, I could yeah. and I, I would and I would learn something every single time, partly because Daniel Day-Lewis is <laughs> yeah. absolute monster. But uh, But yeah, so... Yeah, it's just fan- phenomenal. Really, yeah, really I, think, good. Okay. I think his only film that I just did not like, even though it was still, but it goes right to your point, like there's still a lot that's likable, uh, is Inherent Vice. It's just such a unfollowable movie um, that it's, mm, yeah. it's really hard to watch. Yeah. Um, but I get it. I get even it. within that, every single scene is fantastic. <laughs> it's still yeah. like really good. It's yeah. weird. It's such a... I agree. That guy is just amazing. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so thanks uh one i guess one last shout out thanks uh izzy for this request um hope oh, yes. hope we did it justice excited to hear more of your thoughts on this one um definitely so thanks, man. what are you going to recommend this week man uh another pta film that uh has one of my favorite actors of all time in it uh, joaquin phoenix the master and obviously um uh has the our resident whatever what's his name philip seymour hoffman yeah I, i'm so bad with names i forget him every single time uh in it and it's just an, another acting clinic um it's it's not the most rewatchable film it's you know um very you know pointed at one specific you know focus but if you can get past that and just and just watch it for a piece of art it's it's really really a beautiful film and you know um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, being gone, this is one of his best performances, I think. Um, I mean, there's so many, there's so many others, uh, but in this particular case, I just, I love him in this film. So, and I think that was like, uh, 2000, what like is it? 2014? Oh, 2012, 2012. 2012. Okay. Yeah. Um, That's and the color, I, I love the color in the master, like he oh has all gosh. these muted tones. God, it's yeah. just gorgeous. Yeah. And he shot it in 65 millimeter, uh, which yeah. I got to see it projected at the Alamo. Ooh. God, it's beautiful, gorgeous. <laughs> um, I'm gonna recommend uh, watching this. I was just like, this is a performer's movie, um, and so if you want to see another incredible performance, there's there's a Netflix movie called Pieces of a Woman, and it has Shia LaBeouf oh, yeah. and Vanessa Kirby. And Vanessa Kirby was starred alongside Tom Cruise in one of his Mission Impossible films. Um, but she puts on in Pieces of a Woman one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. Like, it, she wow. goes through like a, a pregnancy, um, uh, giving birth, child labor, and it's just uh, mesmerizing. Like, she is, she is incredible. Um, yeah, so if you want to watch something that's very moving, um, but just a great performance, uh, it's great. Shia's fine. He, he does what he does, but um she watch it for her like because she is okay astronomically good um i will nice um stay tuned for next week next week is valentine's day um and so we're gonna we're gonna check out a little little chick flick one of my favorites uh a little something called notting hill with uh, hugh grant and julia roberts um i'm excited about this i've seen this movie a thousand times so uh, if you want to just okay. kind of a little little kitschy you know Uh, do your thing so stay tuned for that next week don't forget subscribe review uh leave us a note um shout out again to izzy for for doing this one if you want to leave a note on this episode you can do that at the pestlepodcast.com slash magnolia and our quote of the day is exodus 8 2 if you refuse to let them go i will send a plague of frogs on your whole country i yeah i find that really interesting because if I'm trying to just think in relationship to this movie. 
And I'm, I'm wanting it, and this might be me just stretching it, but I'm wanting it to mean more than just an excuse to insert frogs um, into, uh, you know, the end of the movie. Um, and so I'm thinking like, okay, in this point in, in you know, Jewish history, um, they're enslaved to the Egyptians, um, and God right now is sending Moses uh, to tell the Pharaoh like, hey, let, let those people go. Um, or I'm going to send a plague of frogs um, on 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 your country, and so it's kind of becoming this symbol of the idea that you know w- these people in this story were holding each other captive, um, and some some of these characters were were holding um, like the 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 father. Um, there's two fathers in this in this case. Uh, there's the one that's on his deathbed that's dying. Um, and he had been holding his son captive, right? Uh, his son was holding himself captive with his inability to, to forgive his dad. And it was clearly destroying his life. Like he was going down this really bad road of hatred and uh, misogyny and um, just othering women. Like half the people on the planet uh, were targets to him. Um, and that's really an unhealthy place for him to be. And it was stemming from his relationship with his father. Um, and his, he needed to forgive his father, um, and was, you know, unable to do so, um, and insert frogs, like here's a plague. Um, and similar, like Jimmy Gator was holding, uh, his daughter captive by just not owning his, his, his garbage, um, not owning what he did to her. Um, and he had kind of enslaved, you know, his wife and his daughter in the process. Um, how can they heal if he won't, you know, admit to what he's done? Um, and it, so it felt like a lot of people were being held um, captive by their past and by uh, things that they wanted and wouldn't give themselves. Um, and so they, you know, God, so to speak, sent a plague in order to encourage them to, to let themselves go and to, to let you know, freedom, you know, reign, so to speak. I don't know. That's my very terrible attempt at, you know, rationalizing the insertion of uh, Exodus um, and the frogs into the, into the movie. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, the, the reference to the frogs in the Bible wasn't raining frogs. Right. They came out of the sea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And in this case, it raining frogs was just like, something that happened yeah right huh. right uh um it has rained frogs before well i don't know if it's literally rained them so much as well, they got swept up in a storm um yes. and, yeah. and in that sense like i don't know how i don't know what else that means that <laughs> raining frogs that sounds like raining frogs to me well i don't think like tadpoles were caught up in evaporation and condensation no um, no that's not to precipitate no like, that would neither were these be rain frogs. Like yeah, it's never I rained the, sand. There's been sandstorms. <laughs> yeah, I think the the point. I think it's perfect yeah. because the the point is whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe in the in, in the intervention of God in your life or in other people's lives at all, it doesn't matter because this just happened. If that's the case, right? If that's the case where you don't believe in God. And I'm not a religious person, um, but you don't believe in God. Then this is just a thing that happened, right? And so the frog uh, stopping, what's his name, from killing himself. The, you know, like all of those things just happen um, because of this thing. But if you do believe in God, right, then it was an intervention, a, a miraculous intervention that doesn't happen every day um, to intervene in these people's lives. Now, for you and me, who are not part of any of these these stories, mm-hmm. then that's just something that happened, right? But for these people, maybe that's it's a little bit more. And so I think he's it's it's a play on whatever you might actually believe. Um, it's like it's like prodding on that. Do you really believe that? Because look at this. Like we don't believe in God, right? Okay, you don't believe in God. Well, look at this. Look at look at what happened here. That's kind of weird. That doesn't just happen, but it just happened to us. Uh, or if you do believe in God, well, yeah, but raining frogs? I mean, really? That doesn't 
you know? Yeah, so, so maybe it's a bit of a plea to get us to all connect with each other and to see the connections with each other. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Yes. And even even in the end, where when Claudia, uh, when Jim comes to her bedside, I mean, that's it's such a perfect moment with that they don't cut away. They stay on her. They don't show Jim. They don't show anything. It's just her. Oh man, it's so, it's, it's emotional. It's just her deserving love and getting it. She gets it and, and she gives it to us. Like she then passes it to us by giving us a moment of a look at the end. And we, and she could have not, it could have been, that could have not happened. Yeah. She could have not looked at us and it would have been a beautiful ending. But to look at us and and or somebody, she looked at somebody. It might not have been me and it might not have been you, but mm. somebody watching this movie, she looked right at that person that needed that at that moment, right? And that she was passing that love. Because what was Jim say? Or not Jim, but uh, Wiz Kid Donnie Smith. I have so much love to give. How do I give it? How many people feel that? Mm. All the time. So much love to give, how I don't, and no one to give it to. Now she's getting it, and she's immediately giving it away. It's just, it's so beautiful and perfect. And I, I mean, maybe that's the, that's the other aspect. It's like, um, uh, that's the aspect of it that I like to think about, of, um, God not being up there, mm. but in all of us, and in the way that we interact with each other, and the way that we proliferate love you know, across space and time and screens. Um, and that being a perfect ending to a film that's trying to do just that, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this had to be the, this had to be the quote of the day. Yeah. Yeah. There's no <laughs> it just <doubt>. had to <laughs> be. <laughs> that's good. Anything I mean, else to add? Yeah. Well, it's, I just think it's funny. This really doesn't add much, but uh, last week I read yeah. The Alchemist for the second time. Uh, it's been a while. Oh, yeah. um, great book. And I just think it's funny, like in this past week, I've because uh, Melchizedek shows up in at the very beginning of uh, The Alchemist and Melchizedek is a, a biblical figure, a uh, king from, I want to say he, he met Abraham and gave him like whatever first tithe uh, was given to, to Melchizedek but whatever so it was just like oh man there's there's been an awful lot of like Genesis and Exodus and Old Testament in my life this week um, yeah. <laughs> they're the, the worst by the way they're the, they're the worst they are the they're worst, the worst. Yeah. you go read them they're, they're the absolute worst Genesis is fun Exodus my god it's the only thing worse is like Leviticus that, that book is beast good god yeah we should do an episode on the bible yep I'll, I'll, I'll need to read it a few times. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably read it more than me. Uh, yeah, I've definitely read it. Yeah, you know, I went to Catholic school. I think you probably read it more than me. <laughs> oh, well, this was fun, man. Same. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Izzy, for... Uh, I don't know what just happened there. Something dinged. Thank you so much, Izzy, for the, the suggestion here. That I, Great, great film. We yep. really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, so make sure you join us next week. We'll be doing Notting Hill, so make sure to watch that before uh, jumping in here. Um, and review, uh, subscribe, all that good stuff. Share us with your friends. It all helps. Uh, make a suggestion. If you suggest something, we'll probably do it. Um, uh, and, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode as well. Until next week, I'm Todd. I'm Wes. Go watch some movies. Mm-hmm.